and I wanted to just take a little time to chat about the importance of different electives for candidates who are thinking about internal medicine or thinking about internal medicine as a preliminary to other training that they'll do after medical school. So one of the thoughts that often asked to us is what electives should we take if we're going to get ready to be an intern in internal medicine or to prepare us for the future. And I think the most important thing I can say is have fun with your electives because it's probably the last time that you get to choose what it is that you would want to learn about without a definition in your training program about what's required. So for example, take ophthalmology or take otolaryngology or take some orthopedics or take some things that within the training program of internal medicine you're not likely to get as much exposure to those things and having some very good skills in doing the joint exam, doing a slit lamp exam of the eye or recognizes recognizing oral pathology or things about hearing or things in the throat, those are all particularly good skills to augment what you're going to need in internal medicine. Now others would say, but be sure to be ready for the topics that are important um, such as cardiology or pulmonary or nephrology or infectious disease. I think that those can be important and maybe taking a choice among those, but also being sure to take for example, radiology. I think that's an incredibly great skill no matter what you go into, having some time electively to read films with radiologists and see the different technologies would make you very well prepared um, as a house officer. The one thing I would say that's probably critical to do if you're going to enter as an intern in internal medicine is a sub-internship. And you'll hear this theme very likely from others that it allows you to gain the skills of confidence in managing patients in a way that you may not have gotten as a third year. And as a preparation and an understanding of the rigors, really, of being an intern. It's a, it is a very big leap between being a clerk in medicine or in the other clerkships and being actually an intern in one of your specialties. And so it's important for you to be ready and it's a way of having a truncated schedule so that you don't have a full complement of patients, but you function in every way just like an intern would, learning how to take care of a patient in a, in a way with different responsibilities than one had as a student. So I think that's a clear one. So to recap the answer to what to do if you're going to become an intern in internal medicine or go into a residency in internal medicine, have fun, take electives that, ex that expand your mind, take some humanities even, do things that are different than you'll get a chance to do for a long time afterward. Um, radiology would be a recommendation, sub-internships sub uh, I would think would be really a requirement. It's not really a requirement when we look at people, but we particularly look at their experience as a sub-I and what people thought of them uh, and how they did at that. So I hope that answers one of your questions. Um, I'll uh, read the second question here that was posed was, um, what if you're a strong candidate versus a weak candidate? I think the sub-I again is going to be something that would help a weaker candidate. Let's say they didn't do all that well in a medicine clerkship and they want to prove themselves able to be competitive for the most competitive internal medicine programs. The sub-I would be a way to do that, sub-internship. That shows then that you've matured, maybe medicine was taken early on in the third year, and that through the third year a student matured more, such that now in the sub-I they show themselves fully capable to do honors level work or high level work, and that would pull up a weaker student to a stronger position. I think that would be good. What if you're interested in going into global medicine? Uh, there are many global medical electives now that can be done. Uh, here at Dartmouth, we're, as you know, expanding our global presence on many of the continents. And I do think that this is a very valuable area to spend time. Even if you're not a globalist or going into global medicine, I think it's just a great idea to go out and see the world and to see healthcare systems in the rest of the world. I've spent time in Latin America, uh, both in South America and in Mexico. And I think that that was a really expanding opportunity for me to see how it's done in other countries. I've also had a lot of exposure to European medicine. And just to get an idea, but also 
if you pick a place where you can make a difference, it's a very rewarding opportunity to give something to the world. Uh, and there are many opportunities to do that, and I would highly suggest it. And it will probably look very good on your application that you've spent time. Not that you did it to boost your credentials, but you did it because you really take seriously helping mankind. And I think those things are important to, to do. What if you can't decide whether you want to do internal medicine, psychiatry, family practice? Actually, I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to do neurology. I don't know why. At the time, neurology was a bit dry. It didn't have procedures uh, like CAT scans and other things that made it more obvious what was going on. It was much more about the physical exam. It's an incredibly cognitive um, specialty, and it's great. I knew I didn't want to do that, but I didn't know if I wanted to do OBGYN, surgery, medicine, family practice, psychiatry, I actually thought I would do. Medicine is a place where you can always do medicine and go on to other things from that. In fact, I couldn't decide so much that I chose internal medicine, thinking I would do both internal medicine and then psychiatry. But I fell in love with internal medicine and stayed in it and then became a gastroenterologist because I really liked surgery and GI was a place where I could work with my hands at the same time of doing internal medicine and the intellectual and cognitive stimulation of that part of internal medicine. There was a lot of psychiatry in gastroenterology. There were men and women, young people and old people. There was adolescent medicine which was part of PEDS and I liked PEDS. So you can find within internal medicine both a stepping stone to other residencies, if you decide to do that, or within internal medicine, pieces of the subspecialties there that might meet your needs as you're trying to decide what to do. The big thing is, you have a lot of time in the rest of your life, and you can always pick a residency and switch around. People do that. Um, if you need more time, you can take an academic year to explore topics and then decide what residency to enter. There are so many options of things to do with that. Is it good to audition at a hospital the student is interested in? I think that it is. Uh, I think it's valuable if you're thinking about going across the country perhaps to do your residency or a city in one location or another or wherever you're heading. It's probably a good idea to set up an elective in that area to judge for yourself by talking with the house officers who are there, seeing the faculty interactions, judging their M&M conference and their medical grand rounds conferences, really getting a flavor of what your life would be like there. I don't know that you have to spend time at lots of different campuses, but at least get away from here and see how medicine is practiced at other institutions and try that out for yourself. I, I do support that and I think that's good. I did that. I thought it was very valuable to be able to judge other institutions by doing some selected electives there. And our final question of how much do you need to know when you are graduating medical school? Well, I'm also in one of my jobs, the Dean for Continuing Medical Education. So I know that we go to medical school for four years and we're in practice for probably 40 years or something like that. You will be a lifelong learner and we're delighted with the continuum of learning that begins in undergraduate medical education, goes through into graduate medical education, and then for the rest of your life is in continuing professional education. We learn the skills of acquiring knowledge and implementing that knowledge in our practices at all of those levels as an undergraduate, graduate, and continuing student. And so you don't have to know everything, but you need to develop the skills to find out how to know what you need to know. And self-reflection and self-assessment are very important tools for lifelong learning. You always assess yourself of what your patient needs and what you need to learn in order to take best care of your patients. Um, no matter what you go into, you're going to be a lifelong student, lifelong learner, and that's the real fun of it all. Thank you.